My last video talked about a lot of different necromancy ideas in a very general sense. These ideas were meant to help flesh out a fantasy world with interesting details and act as a springboard for ideas. Now it's time to talk about something in a little bit more detail. The topic for today is the Necromancer Apprentice. This will be my first video on the path from Necromancer Apprentice to a well-learned Necromancer and finally the ascent to Lichdom. First I'll begin with why someone would be drawn to Necromancy. Speaking for myself, I love minions. They're loyal, trustworthy. A minion would never betray his master, and a minion would always be the most obedient of servants, fighting valiantly and bravely against any foe. Fantastic companions, lovingly crafted by the necromancer's own hand. For someone like me, the love of minions would be enough. When I was a little kid playing games like Diablo 2, I'd sometimes be afraid of whatever might be up ahead, but the minions were never afraid. They rushed valiantly ahead and fought bravely until they perished. The bravery of my minions bolstered my own bravery, because I knew the loyal minions always had my back. A necromancer like me would seek out every musty tome and study the secrets within. They'd want ever more minions, perhaps even just for the sake of it. Each and every minion they would create would be remembered, sometimes even named. Great pride is taken in their creation, and every minion that perishes in service to the necromancer is honoured. I would name such a character a passionate necromancer. This character loves the craft of necromancy above all else. But there are other motivations. Imagine the power-hungry character. Even if your character does not have a love for their minions, they may simply want to have a loyal and convenient army. Minions ask no questions. They'll carry out any order you give them, and they require no payment. As such, any power-hungry character would immediately be drawn to necromancy. There is no task too awful, and no deed too evil for a minion to perform. Any power-seeker could not resist the temptation. Their minions would be a means to an end, and they'd take less pride in their creation. Everything would be functional. No lovingly crafted skeletons of high quality, instead more utilitarian minions would be preferred. But there's more. Imagine the loner, bullied by his peers and not quite understood by those around him. The outcast. There's always been these people in society and they can become bitter, extremely bitter. With access to necromancy, a character like this would want to see the world burn. And what better way to destroy this wretched, cursed world than with an army of loyal, unwavering necrotic minions? The ones that mocked them would be destroyed and become minions themselves. Yes, the haters of the world would indeed be drawn to necromancy. It doesn't matter how shunned they are by society. The dead ask no questions, and the path of necromancy welcomes them with open arms. Imagine the righteous. Yes, even the righteous could make use of necromancy. A good person in an evil society could see wrongs all around them. Criminals fleecing good citizens, or perhaps the tyrant's police committing atrocities on the general populace. What better way to topple a tyrant than with an army of minions? As long as the character has no reason to dislike necromancy, the path remains open to them. In the Forgotten Realms universe, a special kind of lich called the Baelnorn exists. These Baelnorn are created from volunteers to serve as guards over elven tombs. These Baelnorn are good aligned, unlike the liches which tend to be evil aligned. One of the coolest things about necromancy is I feel that it can be very flexible. It can be a force of evil in your world, and in most fantasy it's typecast as evil, but it need not be evil. In most cases it would be neutral. If a corpse is just lying there, it's not going to hurt anyone to use it. It could even be a force of good. Imagine a world stricken by horrific disease, people dropping dead left, right and center. A group of well-meaning necromancers could provide citizens of undeath and prevent them from perishing from disease, and they would also replace all those dead workers that had perished and get society back on track. These various traits can be combined too. For example, you could have a righteous loner necromancer or a power-hungry, passionate necromancer. Anyway, 
That hopefully gives possible insights into the mind of a new necromancer. So how does an apprentice, regardless of his motivations, begin to learn the art of necromancy? Well, as I discussed in my last video, I do like the idea of necromancy being an ancient and obscure science. With the aid of a few books, a necromancer could begin learning the basics and slowly become better at his craft. It would be a slow process, and the necromancer would need to require the tomes somehow. But musty tomes aren't the only way. Perhaps knowledge of basic necromancy could be granted via premonition. A powerful necromancer may wish to reach out to a suitable individual and take them on as an apprentice. Via communication magic, an apprentice could begin learning from the master. In exchange, the master would gain a foothold in the apprentice's village. The apprentice could function as a spy, in the very least, and he could even begin to start preparing for his master's invasion of the village. A master necromancer would likely reach out to multiple individuals in all kinds of different locations, so if one is found and destroyed, there will be others in the works. Each of these necromancer apprentices may believe that they're the only apprentice, which would also reduce the chance of them being discovered, because they'd have no knowledge of each other and wouldn't ever be found together. This would also aid the master necromancer against treachery. They'd likely be traitor apprentices willing to betray their master to the authorities, or authorities that are posing as willing apprentices spies or undercover agents, in other words. In a world where necromancy is derived from a god, then worship would be required. In such a situation, necrotic power would be probably a gift bestowed upon the necromancer apprentice by their god. A necromancer whose powers are derived from a god and not from science is likely to have less understanding of their craft. It would be like being given a fish instead of learning how to fish for yourself. The power to raise the dead would be linked directly to the god and could be revoked from the apprentice at any time, leaving them completely powerless. This would be especially awful for a worshipper of a capricious god. They could find their necromancy granted to them, or revoked from them, for reasons largely unknown to them. This is one potential problem I see with divinely inspired necromancy. You could of course do a mix of both. In a world of science-based necromancy, a necromancer apprentice could learn their craft on their own through trial and error, but it would probably be ideal for a necromancer apprentice to have a mentor to accelerate the learning process. Figuring stuff out on your own is possible, but arduous. In this case, it's likely that the mentor would be a more experienced necromancer, but that isn't necessarily the case. In the case of divinely inspired necromancy, as I said before, there wouldn't be a mentor as such. Necromancy abilities would be bestowed upon the worshipper for pleasing their god. So instead of learning about necromancy itself, they would be required to perform their god's work and the reward would be necromancy. The lessons provided by a mentor to their apprentice could be delivered face to face, as they would usually be in our real world. But in a world where necromancy and magic exists, I find other methods to be more practical. In the case of a god of necromancy that is seeking out new priests, the god is likely to be able to sense the desires of mortal minds, or know their thoughts about them realizing it. To begin down the path of necromancy, all that would be required would be a dream provided to their faithful. In the case of a mortal mentor, dreams could be used to instruct an apprentice in the ways of necromancy as well. Another possibility would be telepathic communication, or some kind of magical projection, like communicating via an image in a mirror. But I personally like the dream idea because it's most mysterious and seems to be very good for storytelling. It leaves a lot of open room for speculation. Imagine this. John returns to his bed after a long, hard day's study at the Majors Academy. He was never a top student and performs averagely in his school. The fireballs his peers throw around bore him and the teachers at the academy deem him to be an underachiever. They've even begun to resent him. Young John has a morbid fascination for the occult, and the librarian of the school has taken notice of the unusual books he checks out of the library. Unknown to many, the librarian has hidden affiliations and uses her position to profile students by observing which books they read 
and by being privy to information gained via gossip and observation. She's assembled quite a profile on young John and has decided he would be a good candidate for indoctrination. The occult books he's been reading have been slowly influencing his mind. They've planted the seeds of suggestion within him and made his unconscious mind a beacon to certain forces. That night, John falls asleep and finds himself dreaming. He's lying down on a dusty floor. He's in some kind of old house. The interiors of the house are dark and dusty, as if the house has been long abandoned. As he gazes out the window, he can see the academy in the distance, not too far away, and he appears to be on the second story of the house. He realizes he's seen this dilapidated house before, an old shack on a nearby hill, and had never thought much about it. Suddenly, he hears a loud thud from downstairs, and the sound of splintering wood. Frightened, he runs downstairs, and he seems to instinctively know where he's going, even though he's never been here before. On the ground floor of the building, he can hear wood splintering under the force of a battering ram. The fireplace of the building is unusually tall, more like a doorway than a fireplace. He finds his dream self reaching for a particular brick in the fireplace. As he reaches out, he sees his own hand is somehow malformed. It's rotten, and maggots are writhing around in the flesh and falling down onto his boots. He is overwhelmed by the stench of decay and awakens in a cold sweat. What disturbs him most is upon waking he can still smell the stench as if a rotting creature had been in the room moments ago. And oddly, his window was open, even though he had shut it before going to sleep. As he went to shut the window, he saw the remains of a shack on a nearby hill. John knew what he had to do. From here, our character John could go on to recover terms of knowledge about necromancy from a hidden basement within the shack as well as learn about the previous necromancer that lived here and how he was exposed. So, I think that's about all I have to say about the necromancer apprentice. We've covered the motivations as to why someone would want to learn necromancy, and then we covered how they would learn it. We also covered the motivations of the master necromancer, about why he would need new apprentices, and about how he would go about instructing them. Hopefully I haven't missed anything. You've probably got some ideas of your own. If you do, please comment below. I'd be very interested to read them. You can also join the Discord if you want to discuss your ideas with fellow necromancers. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you for the next video.